Our closing speaker uh, taught, it, taught for 39 years at Juniata College in Huntington, Pennsylvania, where he started the ceramic program in 1968. He, he has written several books, including the following, Salt Glazed Ceramics, Wood-Fired Stoneware and Porcelain, uh, a book of poems um, calling the planet home, a book honoring his friend David Shainer, Inscapes. And he's written numerous articles for magazines in our field and has made pots in over 25 countries and has given over 200 workshops. It's funny, though, when I asked Jack to do this, uh, he responded in, in, in a way any self-identified, self-respecting introvert would with absolute horror. <laughs> it was really interesting because, because somebody with the stature of Jack, was, he was just horrified. And, and so we, uh, we talked and we talked and we talked some more. And as he put it succinctly, he, he said sub salutatorians of their high school bear that stigma for life. And, and he said he thought it was a mistake for being singled out for such an honor. Um, he said, actually, this has to be a mistake. Don't these people know I graduated second to last? <laughs> well, as we continued to chat during that first phone call, he, he, he remembered that uh, the best in Sika closers had already been given by, by those of, of the likes of Bill Daly, Don Wrights, Cindy Bringle, Malcolm Davis, and some 40 others. He finally said that he could trust and I think um, because of Cindy, he could trust a high percentage of the audience would be checking their email and thinking about, about lunch at, at 10.37 uh, on a Saturday afternoon at Inseca. So this morning, with the bar set low, as Jack put it, he had several powder milk biscuits for breakfast, knowing they give shy people the strength to get up and do what needs to be done. Please join me in welcoming Jack Troy to his 46th NSICA conference to deliver our 49th closing talk, Anecdotal Evidence. I liked it better in high school where the junior varsity acts went first. And um, I feel as though the, the real closer has already been given by Roberto. And uh, <laughs> so I'm the junior varsity closer. <laughs> This is a 500-year-old whistle, and that's the sound that the people who made it actually heard in Mexico. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, <clears throat> and everyone who thought it might be a good idea for me to give this year's closing conference and for honoring my mid-career as a potter. <laughs> <clears throat> Mud junkies of all stripes, potsaholics, sculptophiliacs, slab centrics, decalcomaniacs, pinch squinchers, mold depressors, jiggerheads, and castaways. <laughs> My talk is anecdotal evidence because I agree with one of our finest writers, William Maxwell, who said, I wouldn't want to live in a world where no one told stories. M.C. Richards and Paulus Berenson are two of our clan who wrote about the relationship between what we make and its effect on us. The other making, who we are and are becoming because we work in clay. The stories we inhabit, concoct, and share, the anecdotal evidence of what we do with clay isn't a byproduct of what we really do. They are as connected as a cup that looks as though it grew a handle or a lid that fits perfectly in just one place in the universe. As Gabriel Garcia Marquez observed, what matters in life is not what happens to you, but what you remember and how you remember it. 
I offer mine in the spirit of Galway Cannell, who could have been speaking of anecdotal evidence when he said, to me, poetry is somebody standing up, so to speak, and saying with as little concealment as possible what it is for him or her to be on earth at this moment. This is the house we lived in in northern Pennsylvania for 11 years in the mid-1940s and 50s. To say it needed work when we moved in would be to understate such facts as the previous owners keeping chickens in an upstairs back room. <laughs> After weeks of cleaning it, it became our tool shop where we made stuff. We were always making stuff. We didn't have any art in the house. But as the Catholic Church honors the knuckle bones of saints, we had our own homegrown relics, like my brother's tonsils. <laughs> They'll save them for you, someone told him before the operation. And when he woke up, there they were in a little mayonnaise jar in alcohol. <laughs> they were the size and color of chewed bubble gum the adenoids clotted yellow tallow. When the alcohol evaporated, we'd pour new in and watch them bob and sink and settle and soften. <laughs> Our chums dared us to take them out and touch them, but the closest we came was to skewer one on a fork and everyone ran screaming off the porch. <laughs> Once he charged, brandishing them into the north living room, mortifying mother and her guests. <laughs> One afternoon on my way home from school, a classmate told me about a man who had gone to jail for opening his pants and showing Judy Cregeer his tonsils. <laughs> Why, I wondered, had he kept his little jar in there? <laughs> When I teach workshops, I often ask participants if they can remember their first aesthetic experience, what Stanley Kunitz claimed was at the heart of every poetic imagination, a cluster of images associated with personal identity, and they are the purest concentration of self. Stanley Kunitz said, poetry happens when new images are brought into the gravitational field of the new life. My first pivotal moment happened on those porch steps early one morning in 1947 when I was nine. I sat looking through an old brass sea captain's telescope across the Susquehanna River nearly a mile away where a circus was being set up in a big field. Crossing the clearing, a handler walked the first elephant I'd ever seen outside a picture book. The rest of the world fell away from that telescope's eyepiece when the elephant waded out belly deep, inhaled a snootful of my hometown river, and blew it up in a spray that was backlighted by early light coming over Table Rock Mountain, then did it again. And when you imagine what I just described, you're bringing your own images into the gravitational field of my own life. There's the lawn where one winter we shoveled snow off the grass in a big circle, then gathered paraffin. We pried off jam and jelly jars like big wax coins to melt in coffee cans on a stick fire in the driveway. Working fast, we painted the insides of cardboard boxes with lubricious hot goo, then packed them and eased the snow blocks out, circling them around the astonished grass shaving them to fit just so, and angling the upper layers with a rusty draw knife so they'd lock like Mayan temple stones. Six of us worked one whole Sunday, completing the before supper, the knee-high arched entry of the best igloo south of the Arctic Circle. Dad, an engineer with a low degree of fascination, a low th threshold of fascination and an animated imagination, was my role model for thinking stuff up when I taught. He once got a deer leg from a hunter, tied it on a long stick, 
reached it out the bedroom windows on the roof over that big porch late one Christmas evening to leave reindeer tracks in the snow <laughs> for my brother and I to find Christmas morning. If there's a humor gene, Dad's DNA must have matched that of his cousin, Hugh Troy. He was still a legend at Cornell. One of his tricks included suspending a preserved rhinoceros foot on a rope between him and a friend and tracking it out to a jagged hole in the ice on Beebe Lake, the source of Cornell's drinking water. <laughs> My favorite of Hugh's many capers happened in 1935 in Manhattan, where he was living as a mural painter. Knowing the opening of a Van Gogh exhibition at the Met would be mobbed, and his chances of seeing the paintings were slim. He fashioned a lifelike ear from dried beef, put it in a little velvet lined box together with a card that read in old looking writing. This is the ear that Vincent Van Gogh cut off and presented to his mistress, December 24, 1888. With the help of a friend who worked at the museum, they hung the box on the wall. The opening night crowd mobbed the little box giving Hugh complete access to the paintings. <laughs> there must have been something of uh, Hugh's spirit and dad that morning. I wheeled him on a gurney to the doors of the operating suite in Reading Hospital. I bent over to hug him, and he whispered in my ear, I regret that I had but one kidney to give for my country. <laughs> From our mother, I learned about touch and trust. Come over here under the light was mother's way of asking if she could clean my ears. With my head upturned on her lap and the floor lamp lighting one ear hole, she tugged my lobe the way she did her own, putting on earrings. Seeing where my eyes could never look, spelunking down my soft canal, She'd loop a lacquered bobby pin around a wax stalactite or a little cornflake I'd grown without knowing. But first, there was the time of no breathing, the lengthening tension relating touch and trust. Her steady hand looped something crisp, prizing it loose, sliding it balanced out, and we'd breathe again. She'd lay it on a knee of my dungarees. I'd stare at it, so sculptural, so of me, yet not me. <laughs> there could be two or even three. Then she might say, oh, there's a Lollapalooza. <laughs> and I'd tense for the clatter in my labyrinth. I recently taught a workshop and asked the participants, majority of whom had degrees in ceramics, which periods in the history of our field interested them most. When not a single hand went up, I said a few words that won some puzzled looks. Joe Mon and Staffordshire, blank looks. So I dropped some M-bombs. Mycenaean, Mesopotamian, the word with pot right in the middle of it. Mayan, Ming, Membres, Minoan, Mochica, nothing. Did these folks think ceramics began with that iconic first issue of Ceramics Monthly? <laughs> January 1953, coincident with the early careers of Elvis Presley and Big Mama Thornton. The miscellaneous image blizzard on the screens is meant to remind us that in the evolution of our field, we constitute a miraculous asteroid in an honorable ancient galaxy of mud filiacs who couldn't imagine us. If you take a class and you're not taught anything about ancestral clay folk and other eons and other cultures, you're not getting your money's worth. Do you remember your first telling experience in clay? What is it telling you? Here's mine, and this is what it's telling me. First teacher, a month or more, I must have simply watched what he did with his hands. Lumpen earth flesh forming and reforming. Six months after witching me the spell, he passed. Some mornings waking, 
I'm not sure it wasn't something I dreamed, that synapse of his hands on mine. I can't assume my flesh on earth's can coax a vessel into being. Then the day's first try, I nudge the lump. A bowl's fresh history opens out. The same old hands are up to it again. Jim was the art teacher in the suburban Philadelphia high school where I taught English in the early 60s. He showed me how to make pots and helped me trust myself by saying, Jack, if you have to ask, it isn't centered. <laughs> That's how a Quaker Zen master blows his top. <laughs> uh, when he went to the hospital to donate blood for a colleague, they put him right in bed with advanced leukemia. In six months, he died, leaving his wife and five children under the age of 10. My inheritance was a jagged hole in my heart, three quart jars of cone seven glaze I kept thinning out, and a copy of Daniel Rhodes' Clay and Glazes for the Potter, which opens with a sentence, Clay is a simple material. <laughs> 16 years later, in 1973, the opening of Rhodes' second edition is, Clay is a deceptively simple material. <laughs> He might have added that although clay is a substance with no mind, it can inflict humiliation on the way to teaching humility. <laughs> my father, seeing my helpless affliction with potting, made me a wheel by building a plywood box on legs, attaching a Corvair wheel inside, looping a Ford fan belt between it and a Bendix washing machine motor fastened to a hinged board with a noose on a rope tied to one foot to regulate the speed. <laughs> I made thousands of pots on it, and its less than ergonomic design had the unintended effect of helping a local chiropractor pay off his boat. <laughs> From the beginning, I was intrigued with the wheel's counterclockwise movement which reminded me of the time when my high school team was returning from a track meet. And I sat with Coach and asked him if we'd ever visit a school where we'd run the other way, whether it was only in Berks County or in Pennsylvania where we ran counterclockwise. I could tell he didn't share my curiosity <laughs> when he turned to me and said, oh, Christ, Jack, just run. I took Monday night classes at the Philadelphia College of Art with a gracious gentleman named Louis Mendez, who asked me one question that had only one answer. Jack, do you want to keep making what you're making, or do you want to learn to make really good pots? <laughs> when I answered correctly, he asked me to throw half a dozen six-inch cylinders and cut them in half. Each one was a small, tornado-proof doorstop. <laughs> the bottles I'd been making had fine profiles, but they weren't hollow enough because they lacked that ancestral cylinder that goes into every well-made bottle. Louis's question had been an invitation to make quality a priority in my work, and was also a way for him to know whether I took the class to play with clay or whether I was a learnable subject to whom he might be of use. Once I told Lewis I might make up in persistence what I lacked in intelligence, and he said, oh, Jack, persistence is intelligence. My learnability must have prompted him to suggest studying that summer with Val Cushing at Alfred, who provided a brilliant, understated welcome to be curious about our materials and their potential to shape our friendships, lives, and dreams. Change of subject. This is called Me and Nansika. <laughs> In 1966, I attended the organization's first meeting at Michigan State University with Miska Petersham, my grad school sensei at uh, Kent State. Everyone seemed to be within about 10 years of each other's age, 
and for decades nobody died. It would have been unthinkable. There were no geriatric dudes. There were no anecdotal evidence. The early gatherings always featured a potlatch or lottery when we exchanged pieces of which we were proud. The absence of commercialism of any kind was absolute and absolutely marvelous, 110 proof education. We could have all fit into the average freight elevator and we were creating a past for Ensika. Our collective imaginations could not comprehend that most of you were invisible, pre-zygotic non-beings <laughs> who would eventually find yourselves here today in Providence, home to the world's largest bug. <laughs> it's on the roof of New England Pest Control, a big blue termite, 58 feet long and 928 times actual termite size. <laughs> We would never have guessed that among you, there'd be enough piercing, heart, piercing hardware to fill 10 Don Wright's tea bowls, <laughs> or tattoos equal in linear square footage to both sides of seven bags of garlic. <laughs> 10 years later, we met in Baton Rouge for the most ambitious conference to date. So ambitious, in fact, as I recall, it took Ensika two years to balance the books from flagrant overspending. <laughs> One Alfred grad who worked at General Motors built a magnificent exact scale model of a 54 Corvette out of clay on a framework of two by fours, carefully setting the chrome headlight cowlings, door handles, and taillights into the clay and demonstrating that every vehicle exists as a top secret clay model years before it appears in a showroom. Right now, clay models are being made for the uh, 2019 and 2020 models, and they, are, it, they work in incredible secrecy, no photographs, and it all starts with clay. We built a good-sized salt kill and fired it near a pond on a big expanse of lawn at LSU's beautiful campus. At the end of a long day after my slide talk, I went to my room to clean up before a late dinner. In the shower, I heard the soft clicks of my door opening and closing. Soon, a young researcher I'd never met nor would ever see again joined me, introducing herself and her project by saying, while you were giving your talk, you seemed as if you might be gay, so I thought I'd see if you were at least bi. Would you please hand me the soap? <laughs> if it occurred to me that I couldn't support that sort of objectification of men, the notion must have swirled down the drain as I passed the soap. Atlanta, 1983, Bill Daly and several henchmen are standing staging a spontaneous event on stage in the auditorium before his closing talk. Boxes of apples are at their feet and they're lobbing the fruit out to us shouting, don't eat these apples, don't eat these apples. Several cohorts walked among us passing out more fruit, cautioning, don't eat these apples. When the many dozens of apples had been handed out, Bill took the mic and delivered a brief, poignant eulogy for Michael Cardew, who had died a few weeks before. He was one of us, Bill said, after briefly summarizing Cardew's career. Robert Benchley observed that the world is divided into two kinds of people, those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. <laughs> <coughs> and Cardew was one who did. He claimed there were mud potters and fire potters. Mud potters were enthralled with the haptic transformational physicality of manipulating clay, and they're glad to let somebody else heat it up and make it permanent. But fire potters would heat up an empty kill just to watch it glow and house flames. <laughs> Cardew, whose enthusiastic presence at the 1972 Ensika conference at Aramont helped hype wild dancing that actually broke a hole in the floor. We circled the danger zone with chairs and kept dancing while a freak snowstorm flattened Gatlinburg's daffodils. Bill conjured up a dissonance between what we had of this brilliant, accomplished gentleman and our palpable sense of loss. 
The best way we can celebrate Michael's life, Bill said, is for us all to bite into the apples of our lives and enjoy them. So let it begin here. He raised his hand. When I drop my hand, bite into your apple. He had chosen the perfect crisp species. That rumbling crunch filled the auditorium and still reverberates here in my chest. Two years later, I missed most of the St. Louis Conference when on the first day, Wayne Higby talked up a book called The Gift by Lewis Hyde and made it sound so promising. I went around the corner, bought it, took it to my room, and began to read, missing lunch and much of the rest of the event. It's such a compelling book, and it was perfectly timed since I'd learned to make two objects that had exactly the same effect on everybody who ever saw them. They reached for their wallet. I could have stopped making anything else and gotten rich, but reading the gift made me realize, made me ask myself, if I made three times as much money, would I be three times more satisfied? What would it cost me intrinsically to make more money? And I never made another one or showed anybody else what they were. Hyde helped me understand time as currency to either spend or invest, and the difference between worth and value. When I win the lottery, I'm going to endow and seek it with the means to occasionally invite the nation's poet laureate, or at least the poet laureate of the state where we're meeting to read at our conferences. Some of you may remember Billy Collins reading in Columbus in 1999. In two years, he would become poet laureate. He must have known how his little poem, Flames, would appeal to us. Flames by Billy Collins. Smokey the bear heads into the autumn woods with a red can of gasoline and a box of wooden matches. His ranger's hat is cocked at a disturbing angle. His brown fur gleams under the high sun and his paws, the size of catcher's mitts, crackle in the distance. He's sick of dispensing warnings to the careless, the nincompoop campers, the dumbbell hikers. He's going to show them how a professional does it. <laughs> if you find what I'm going to tell you next to be unsettling, it's not my intention, though the experience had that effect on me and still does. It was my most mysterious and Sika encounter and it happened 10 or 15 years ago in a convention center hallway when a young man approached me asking, are you who I think you are? <laughs> Every day, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to hold this, he said, handing me one of those small artifacts that happens when we squeeze a thumb-sized ball of clay in our hands and turns it into a fossil-like squidgy. I found where my fingers felt the grooves, felt the heat exchange as my palm cooled and the clay absorbed my body heat. When my brother died in a motorcycle wreck, he said, I took this clay to the funeral home and squeezed his hand around it. I just wanted to share that with you. Our eyes met, I gave it back to him respectfully, and he left. It was a haunting moment. Willa Cather said, the artist spends a lifetime in loving the things that haunt him, in having his mind teased by them, and one of her characters speaks of discovering new things in an old world. <whistles> this is about coming to Huntingdon, where I live. There was a time in my teens when my prefrontal cortex was like the world in Genesis, without form and void. When I had been asked to choose between being intelligent or lucky, I'd have chosen being smart, like all the popular successful members of my class. What had luck ever brought me beside that big walleye in Ontario? Now I wouldn't even flip that coin. I'd go with luck all the way. What use would intelligence have been in 1967 when I took a job in a town 10 miles east of a grog factory that had on hand several hundred pallets of high-duty fire brick 
and 10 miles west of a refractory business with a small mountain of off-spec silicon carbide shells and supports of every shape imaginable. What good would a Mensa grade IQ have been when Juniata College hired me to direct the freshman writing program and five years later let me, with my master's degree in 19th century American transcendentalism, move into an old hardware store and start a ceramics program and go on teaching for the next 35 years. Thankfully, the program continues under the able auspices of Bethany Benson and Rob Bork. In my early years of teaching at Juniata in the 1970s, a fire in a second floor apartment in a downtown bakery closed the place down. The roof had burned completely off the building, leaving the top floor apartment open. One day, peering into a cellar storage room that escaped the conflagration, I discovered a dough mixer I thought we might be able to use for clay. I poked around the ruins of the former bakery and made my way up a carpeted flight of stairs to the apartment. When I looked around a corner, I felt as though I'd been hooked up to a defibrillator that was redlining. There in mid-morning, under a beautiful early May sky, lay a sumo-sized couple making what Rob Lay and Shakespeare called the beast with two backs. <laughs> Despite the fire, the bed still seemed to be under warranty. It did not occur to me to ask, excuse me, do you know anything about the dough mixer in the cellar? <laughs> I sneaked down the stairs as quietly as possible, but couldn't resist tooting my horn as I drove past. Even a world-class scrounger knows when to go off duty. <laughs> Peter Biesecker had been working in a workshop. He, I had met him in a workshop at Ohio's Miami University. Though he majored in business, he wanted to continue working in clay. So I invited him to become a studio assistant at Juniata. He was going to arrive in a month. And answering an ad in a local paper, I arranged to meet the landlord in the four-room walk-up, conveniently close to campus. The place seemed just right, so I wrote a check for the first month's rent and walked downstairs with the landlord. Approaching my truck, I heard him say, uh, Mr. Troy? Uh, yes, I replied. This uh, friend of yours, is he white or black? Oh, does it make any difference? Well, no, it doesn't really. I was just wondering. Oh, I'm glad it doesn't matter, I said, opening the door. But you haven't told me if he's white or black, the man said, walking up to me. You said it didn't matter. Would you like to refund my deposit? Now, look, it doesn't make any difference that way. We're not supposed to discriminate about who we, re who we rent to. I just wonder, is he white or black? Looking right at the man, I said, you know, I can't remember. <laughs> he's your friend, and you can't remember if he's white or black. That's right, I said evenly, getting in and driving away. In my memory's rearview mirror, he's still standing there, looking vexed. <laughs> he could have called during what must have been a very long month. He waited to see Peter's racial profile. Whatever it is, I still can't remember. <laughs> Teaching part-time enabled me to feel the truth of Robert Frost's words. But yield who will to their separation my aim in living is to unite my avocation with my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. My aim in living is to unite my avocation with my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. I made time to buy pots, to buy materials, to make pots, to buy materials for the house and studio I was building, and time to write the Salt Clay's book and poems. One of the teaching goals we share is to put students in situations where they meet and become friendly with their original, originating selves. There were no ceramics majors at Juniata, but there were lots of science and pre-med majors, people with trained, un-American attention spans, accustomed to long looking. The first assignment in a sculpture class was to model a piece of popcorn to scale followed by another version six inches tall, hollow with an integrated lid, and then an 18-inch interpretation morphing into something man-made. 
Another asked them to examine human tissues, bones, and organs seen through an electron microscope and build sculpture incorporating their structural components. To celebrate the first Earth Day, April 22, 1970, we cleaned six pickup truck loads of trash from a little stream running through campus, and we had a commemorative assignment. Make something interesting to find downstream, a colorful hollow stoneware object marked with the maker's name and address at least 12 by 12 inches that would float after firing. We launched them together in the Juniata River with our anti-trash blessings. Many beginning assignments aren't pottery related. Build a model of a house you've lived in. When the assignment is complete, our work table contains a little village that could not exist anywhere else in the world. Each participant writes an essay, the title of which is the address of the house. And in a show and tell, we share the importance of personal space. Make a second model, show it being affected by a force of nature. Shannon Yoder, who was in high school at the time, built a model of her family home in which four or five generations of Yoders had lived. And she showed it being taken over by a tree. And it was the spirit of all the trees that had gone into making lumber for the house revolting and taking back over the house. She got a, a prize in uh, the K-12 exhibition, first prize, and eventually she got a scholarship to Alfred. One of our students seemingly with little effort completed his degree requirements in three years and headed for dental school. Imagine his surprise when he was told by an official that while his academic credentials were impeccable, he hadn't taken any hands-on uh, classes. He might hurt himself or a patient with a drill. The practice of dentist is a fictal activity, one of his interviewers told him. Do you know what fictal means, he was asked. It was suggested he return to Juniata and take ceramics. So he showed up in my class a little bit disoriented. Do you know what fictal means, he says. Sure, I said. That's the word Thoreau uses in Walden to describe the potter's art. Well, I'm here to get fictal, he said. <laughs> he proved a dexterous lad. And if this weren't a weekend, he would probably be up to his second knuckles in the body cavity of his choice. In the early 70s, a student made a series of pots so much like mine that I was astonished by the similarity. Toward the end of the semester, he fired a kill load of his own work and cracked the door prior to his critique later that afternoon. I happened by, looked in at the hot pieces, and I thought, those pots look more like mine than mine do. <laughs> I substituted one of my pieces for one of his, and sure enough, he included it in the critique. <laughs> As our meeting dwindled down after a half hour or so, I picked up my pot and said, this one's quite nice. Yes, he said, it just came from the kill. <laughs> I threw it on the floor. He said, that was one of the best ones. I said, here's yours. I had it under the table. The one I broke was mine. <gasps> oh, that was my piece. That was yours. We had the most wonderful talk then about two of my favorite topics, intention and happenstance. I'll never forget that pot hitting the floor, nor forget how much glee can accompany learning. Eventually, he appeared on the cover of Ceramics Monthly with pots so big I'd never think of trying to pick one up. That critique is still worth a laugh for us both some 40 years later. Um, I wrote the book on salt clay ceramics in 1977, and I really had been involved in salt glazing uh, very passionately for years. And I wrote the book, it came out, I thought it was a good book, I read it, and I also discovered I'd lost all my passion for making salt glaze. So, oh, this is a real surprise. Um, so a couple months later, I was walking around in a flea market near Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and I found that jug. Uh, yep, I found that uh, jug. Uh, made in La Bourne in France. And I liked the story that it told. I liked the way that it had fallen over in the kiln, the ash had melted, and so I got in touch with Rob Barnard, who was working in Japan at the time, and asked him if he would be interested in coming to our college and building a kiln. He sent me this 
uh, form of a small anagama being built in Japan. I, I loved it from the beginning because it's the only kill I'd ever seen that was shaped like fire. I always suspected that fire hates angles, and so it just looked like it would be a nice kill to fire. And also it was simple. So Rob came and we built this small kill in uh, 1978 and um, began firing it. This, a beautiful size kill. We wanted to make it deeper, but we ran on to uh, silica rock and about every third firing, we take out a bushel or two of this sintered rock. So in six years, we almost tripled the size of the kill inside. And we learned about working together, learned about sitting up late at night, exchanging stories, uh, participating in these firings. I loved when we unloaded these kills because people didn't just grab for what they had made. We had a sense of this is what we did. In 83, I went to New Zealand and fired this big kill on the right. I came back and tore the small kill down and built a bigger one on the footprint. We began getting pots that we didn't really understand, but there was a lot to be seen in them. First, I thought, oh, I really like that red. How can I get a pot that's like that all over? And then I woke up and I said, that's because of the gray that the red is red and vice versa. So we were forced to see things that we couldn't understand and get to enjoy them. And about this time, I wanted to go to Japan with a lot of other potters. The big winner in all this was Japan Airlines because Japanese potters were coming to this country because they were fed up with traditions. We felt as though we didn't have enough, so we were passing each other in the air going uh, <clears throat> to, the, uh, to that country. But I wrote to Bill Daly. I told him how enthusiastic I was about wood firing and how I wanted to go to Japan. He wrote me this marvelous letter, stop me in my tracks. He said, don't go to Japan. Whatever you do, don't go there. They'll only teach you what they want you to learn and you'll be in a subservient position with your little empty bowl saying, here's my empty knowledge bowl, please fill it with knowledge. And he said, stay home. He said, learn as much as you can in your own backyard from firing your own kill. Then when you go to Japan and you'll know when it's time to go, then you'll be able to exchange information <clears throat> and be able to relate as peers. So this is what I like doing, splitting wood looking at trees, seeing how they grow, seeing how pap people stack wood, Switzerland and Germany, Pennsylvania. I live right in the middle of the state. I live in a Devonian time zone. Uh, those are some of the mountains that are there. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, house on the right, studio on the left. I negotiate between these two bookcases, ceramics on the left and poetry on the right. 1987, I had a chance to buy brick cheap and uh, built a larger onagama at home. I usually fire this once a year and um, be doing that in June. Then eventually, I did go to Japan and worked in the Tokoname project. Uh, lived with a Japanese family for uh, five weeks and here they're excavating the site of 11 1,000-year-old anagama kills. Traveling really puts you in touch with what I like to think of as felt knowledge. I recommend it. Learn to really appreciate Japanese ceramics. When I came back, I taught a course in Japanese ceramics uh, every uh, four years. 20,000 years of ceramics in 15 weeks, you can do the math. <laughs> and there's uh, Milt bringing a jar to fire in one of the big hills. We started getting some pretty good pots out of there and beginning to gain a little sense of responsibility for them. In 2000, I went to uh, Shigaraki as a visiting artist. This is a pot front and back from that firing. These are some of the pieces I've made. It's a Shino glaze fired in the same kill. Um, fired down inside saggers. Same clay, same glaze, one foot apart, completely different. Um, 
2005, I built a small uh, Anagama with uh, Donovan Palmquist. This is the shed for it. That's the front end of it. Cups. This winter, the birds ate nearly 20 pounds of suet. Most days, I watched them peck and then convert a phantom steer's insides to flight, to feathered warmth a winter's night could not snuff out. Then I drove to class and showed you how to give shape to energy with a potter's wheel. Torquing our planet's flesh, lump after lump, into cups and bowls by the dozens, we gave them form, color, fire, memory. Can you feel in a teacup's heat that friction of change, the combustion of one thing becoming another? These are some porcelain pieces from the wood kills, some cups thrown and altered, jar, double fired, uh, temaku jars, couple of pieces from last summer's firing. Yeah, mostly porcelain. This is from the gas kill. It's about 12 inches high. That's from last summer's firing, porcelain. Another porcelain piece. Another one from last summer. And uh, once a year, I have a sale at home. I've had it for almost 40 years. The last Saturday of October, it's a three-hour sale. It starts at noon, and it's really over by 2 o'clock. But for the last hour, we, we sit around and talk and eat apples. It's kind of a feeding frenzy. And it, uh, it's so nice to be my town's potter. Um, Carol Ann Courier, my partner, and I share the sale with two other potters each year. And it's really a lovely event. People come out and, and support our work. This is what the studio was like a little while ago. That's Carol Ann in her prom gear. <laughs> and uh, she has the cover of Ceramics Monthly this month with her soda glazed work. A couple of her pieces. That's me. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>